started a couple weeks ago, we have reached $932. That's incredible. Let's continue to raise the money so we can reach our $1,000 goal by November 1st. The Religious Freedom Institute is speaking today in chapel and also tomorrow. Today, Dr. Jim Bennett will be sharing on the Bible and religious freedom. And tomorrow, Dr. David Trimble will be speaking about the persecuted church. Tonight, there will be an exciting Q&A with Dr. Bennett and Dr. Trimble at 7 p.m. in the President's Room. At 8.30 p.m. the same evening is a praise night in the chapel. Come for a powerful time of worship together as a student body. On Wednesday from 12.15 to 1 o'clock, the H3 Project is putting on a sleep event. Having a speaker come, come in to speak on sleep, there will be lunch provided for the first 20 students. It is provided by Fresh Coast Kitchen, and the event will be able to be found in room 529 in the Jack. Student government is doing an Alumazoo event this Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. at John Ball Zoo. Sign up at the Kahawa if you would like to go. And Thursday at lunch is a commuter Chick-fil-A lunch for those who have signed up. This week is going to be off the heezy. If you would like to be... Close away, surface clean, pick up your stuff, dishes gleam, trash is out, bed is made, your dorm is clean, hip hip array. Clean your dorms, clean your house, apartments too, I won't leave you out. Make it sparkle, use the vacuum, be an example, we know you want to. Clean your dorms, clean your house, apartments too, I won't leave you out. Make it sparkle, use the vacuum. Use wonders for the houses and apartments. Clean your john and the laundry room, communal space and bedrooms too. Don't forget the kitchen, spend some time, and if those aren't done, you'll get a fine. Clean your dorms, clean your house, the apartments too, I won't leave you out. Make it sparkle, use the vacuum, be an example, we know you want to. Clean your dorms, clean your house, the apartments too, I won't leave you out. Make it sparkle, use the vacuum, be an example, we know you want to. You can clap for that. That's okay, everybody. You can clap. That's a lot of work goes into those. All right. Hey, thank you for being here, everybody. My name is Kyle, and I am excited to share uh, that we have some excellent speaking opportunities or listening opportunities for you to uh, hear from our speakers. This week, you heard Ethan talk a little bit about when those are. Um, but today, uh, in this chapel, we get to listen to... Um, an awesome gentleman from the Religious, hold on, Religious Freedom Institute, and uh, his name's Jim Bennett, and we are excited to hear from him. Usually, at these times, the, the person that's introducing gives a little background, maybe a, a funny little snippet, but today, because of the uh, points that are going to be made, because of the uh, week that we're going to be on a journey listening uh, two, I wanted to read a little bit about Jim and uh, what he's done. So Jim is um, an associate director for the Center of Religious Freedom Education. Jim and associates, uh, uh, sorry, I read that. He also serves as visiting professor of global learning and innovation at Bob Jones University. Prior to his time at the Religious Freedom Education uh, Institute, he spent several years as the director of global education initiatives for Clemson University and served as adjunct uh, faculty in the College of Behavioral, Social, and Health Sciences. He also serves as the Director of Global Learning at EDGE Institute, a DC-based nonprofit that provides innovative educational programs to children living in fragile contexts around the world. He also spent 11 years as the teaching coordinator for the summer language programs at Sichuan University in Zhengzhou, China. In this role, he brought hundreds of U U.S. university students and professors to teach in summer camps and participate in humanitarian efforts in rural vi villages. So super cool, some education experience, some overseas work experience, and uh, I'm elated to bring him up today and to pray over him. So come on up and we will share uh, a moment together and then the stage is yours. Lord, thank you for Jim and his time uh, that uh, he's willing to give to us here at Grace over the next couple of days. Help us to be attentive listeners, uh, hearts open to what's going on in the world, uh, to what Jim has to say. And as we uh, listen, Lord, um, move our hearts 
and uh, allow the words to flow like milk and honey for Jim. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you. First of all, before going any further, I'd like to say that, uh, if possible, I would like to get that video from my 17-year-old son. Uh, I was watching that, and that, that would be very helpful in my context. So he's, he's the only one left at home. We have four children. Three are gone, but uh, he's the one left, and he keeps things messy, to be sure. We have been looking forward to this for quite some time. Uh, you'll meet David Trimble, my colleague who's down here. He'll be speaking in chapel tomorrow. We're looking forward to being with you in some classes today. Uh, the event tonight, I hope a number of you are able to come out. We're, we're going to sort of position that as a sort of a town hall question and answer. I understand there's going to be pizza. If that's not a good enough reason to come out, I suppose maybe nothing else is. But uh, we're looking forward to these couple of days that we're going to be with you and talking about something that uh, is of vital importance. As I just mentioned, I spent a number of years, I've been in higher ed now teaching in professor's roles, uh, administrative roles and like for about 30 years. In fact, this is my 30th year in higher education. Uh, a number of those years were spent, as was mentioned, at Clemson University. Uh, if you're familiar with that, that's an institution that used to play football. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I remember back in, in the days when uh, everyone was eagerly anticipating the year 2020. In fact, our strategic plan, I remember, at, at that university, like many places, was uh, 2020 vision. And everyone was looking forward to this formative year, and then 2020 hit. And 2020 did not happen how most of us had envisioned it was going to happen. Uh, in this country, 2020 began with a, a deadly global pandemic, uh, the likes of which had not been seen for a century or more anywhere in the world. And, and many of us here today lost uh, loved ones or, or colleagues or neighbors. And then added to that, we had, of course, all of the problems in our major cities, questions about race and justice and equality and the fragility of our, our country and and at times, our cities resembled uh, very unpleasant places as people were out exploring those questions. And, and then add to that a very fractious election that was contentious. And, uh, and all of these things collectively sort of highlighted the fault lines in our, our country, if you will. Regardless of what side of whatever line it is you fall on, Everyone could agree upon that it really was a very challenging and difficult year, and it left the country looking for, how do, we, how do we go forward? I mean, what's the next step in getting out of this and creating a better world, a better country, if you will? And in these brief minutes that I have here today, I actually want to propose two things to you uh, in answering that question. You know, how do we move forward? What's the next step in all of this? The main thing I want to talk about, I really think will set us up for, for success in answering this question. And then the other thing that certainly will be woven throughout all of my remarks here over these next few minutes, at the end of the day, is the answer. It's the answer to all questions. It's the answer that makes all things better. So I hope you got a handout coming in here today. We're just going to work through some slides, and we're going to kind of work our way through those two things. As you pull that out and get a pen ready or whatever, let me just quickly introduce a little bit more about who we are and why we're here. So as was mentioned, we're the Religious Freedom Institute. Uh, our offices are 316 Pennsylvania Avenue. If you know D.C. at all, our, our office is... Uh, one block right behind the U.S. Supreme Court building and two blocks from the U.S. Capitol building. So we're right there basically on Capitol Hill. And it positions us nicely to impact this conversation about religion and religious freedom in this country and around the world. We do a lot with legislators, with, with uh, you know, the Congress, and we work with both sides, both parties. One of the things we'll talk about today is religious freedom is not really a bipartisan issue. You've heard that word, right? Can you do anything? I mean, look, the country is, is just, can you do anything in a bipartisan way and cooperate? But religious freedom is not a bipartisan issue. We like to think of it as a nonpartisan issue. 
that this isn't political. This isn't something that you have to draw a line in. This is something that every single person should be able to embrace. And so that's part of what we're working with members of Congress and the legislative branch to make sure we have good laws and things of that nature that support that. Uh, we also work with executive agencies and we work with, uh, you know, at times the White House when it will work with us and other times it is a little more challenging, but we work with courts and, and, and our RFI files amicus briefs and contributes to those with the Supreme Court, et cetera. I say all that to say this, that what we are primarily doing at the Religious Freedom Institute is not so much just doing those things because, you know, if you have to pass a law to kind of force people to do things, or if something goes as far as a court case, a challenge, something's already broken down, right? Like if it's so contentious that they were arguing over laws or, or were, were there in a courtroom, then something is fundamentally broken down in the culture itself. And so what we're trying to do at RFI is we're trying to impact the cultural narrative. As I mentioned in the, in the opening statement, we're trying to get the right questions asked and then help you and ourselves and anyone that will listen provide the right answers. So that's why we're excited to be here these two days because this is an important part of what we do. Uh, we're doing our best and sometimes it's effective and sometimes maybe it's not, but we know the most effective thing, the, the, the most profitable thing we can do is to make this case to you and then you take it to your friends, your family, wherever God's going to place you uh, next weekend and, and for the, your future, your career path. And so we're hoping that you'll be able to embrace this and take it with you and, and, and spread the word far and wide. One last word and then we'll get to our handout just to clarify who we are. So RFI, we are actually, um, we're not a Christian organization. Uh, we have a number of different faith traditions represented at the RFI. We're all working together to promote religious freedom. Uh, we're not political, we're not partisan. Uh, we're, we're bringing together and trying to live out what we preach, and that is this peaceful pluralism that creates a set of conditions in this country that allows us to do the really important stuff, which is, of course, what we want to talk about a little bit here today. Uh, and then with full disclosure, my own faith tradition, I became a Christian at age 19. I grew up in a Christian home, played around with the truth a little bit, never really made it my own. But at the age of 19, I not only understood the gospel, but I accepted the gospel, embraced it for myself. So I'm, I'm a Christian. That's my background. David can tell you a little bit about himself tomorrow. But just so you know, my frame of reference and where I'm coming from, uh, it's a privilege to be here in your chapel today and to both work through these religious freedom principles and certainly integrate it with God's word. So let's get busy. Let's see what we uh, want to talk about here today. So... There's a number of things that we need to understand about religious freedom. First of all, religious freedom does not assume that all truth claims are equal. I mean, sometimes, uh, especially in these types of settings, people become concerned that religious freedom is, is nothing but an, an ecumenicism or a relativism. Well, not necessarily. Now, using their religious freedom are... Unitarian friends, Universalist friends, they might come to this conclusion, but religious freedom does not assume necessarily that all truth claims are equal. In fact, religious freedom does not assume that all truth claims are even valid. That's not the point of religious freedom. Religious freedom does not look at every single truth claim and say yes, 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 and yes. What religious freedom does do is it assumes that all people have a God-given right to be religious. That, as our founders call it, an inalienable right that what we want to talk about here today and get into God's word and see if we can find some evidence of this fact that, that we were made for a relationship, that we were made to find him, that we were made to apply him and his truths to every aspect of our life. That's religious freedom. What we want to particularly concentrate on here today is the Christian case, if you will. I want to draw a little bit from, from church history, a little bit from the Christian traditions and certainly a lot from God's word to say, okay, so, so RFI, your, your different faith traditions, you're making this case that religious freedom is good for everyone, everywhere, but really as, as a believer, as a Christian, I mean, I don't know all of you, but, but all of you are at least here at Grace Christian University understanding what you're getting here. 
you've at least sort of made a claim that you want to try to figure out God's will for your life and what it means for how you order your steps. And so it seems appropriate. Well, let's, let's get in the Word. Let's find out from a Christian perspective, can we support religious freedom? How do we articulate it to, to an increasingly skeptical world? And then what does it mean for my choices today? So the first thing I want to point out in talking about this religious freedom in our culture, there's this path forward from the contentious 2020 that we just talked about, was that, that God's word makes it very clear that he's not the author of confusion, that he doesn't want us to live in this culture where, where, where we're languishing, that God created us to flourish. It doesn't mean there's not suffering. It doesn't mean there's not trials and struggles. You can flourish even through suffering. But we know that God has a plan for how his creation is supposed to work. <clears throat> Sometimes it's part of what we call a creation mandate even. You know, what it is we're supposed to be busy doing. And, and one of the things that we know about how God intended all of this to work really relates to something that Jesus himself said in Mark chapter 12. Do you remember that story? When they brought to him a penny, it was a denarius, I guess, and, and they said, you know, and, and, and he said, whose inscription is on this? You know, who, whose picture's on that thing? And they said, it's Caesar. And then he gives his famous response, give to Caesar those things which are Caesar's, and give to God those things which are God's. And if nothing else, for our purposes, what he did right there is he said, you know what? You can be a faithful follower of mine, and you can also be a faithful citizen of whatever political system or country I happen to place you in at your time of birth. There's not this, you know, separation. Well, I either have to be loyal to the state or to God. Uh, Jesus himself says you can do both. We don't have time to go through all the details, but... I, I'm looking at notes here. I won't take time to read all of this. I'm thinking of a letter that was written back in the third century. Well, how long have that's what? 18 centuries ago. And, and at the time, if you remember back in your history class, maybe some of you are trying not to do that, but <laughs> you think back and, and you studied you know, the Roman Empire, a political system that was not particularly friendly to the church, right? Uh, sometimes worse than others. And there was this church father, a guy named Tertullian. And Tertullian lives in northern Africa, and the Roman Empire is exceedingly persecuting Christians at that time, and he writes a famous letter. And he writes it to the proconsul of North Africa, kind of like the governor. And the whole point of his letter was basically that as good citizens who are loyal to the emperor, as appointed by God, that Christians deserve to be free to express their faith. And what Tertullian was doing there 1,800 years ago was really laying the groundwork for religious freedom. And he was making the point and building off the words of Jesus himself there in Mark chapter 12, you can be loyal to both. It doesn't always work out that way, but it's not necessarily a problem. So this God in Caesar is a seed we need to plant in our mind to understand how all of this is supposed to work. You can also see there on the screen, though, your next point, and that is that God's desire is that there's a social order. Boy, wasn't that talked about a lot in 2020. But what is the social order supposed to look like? What is justice? You know, what, what is true equality? How, how does that look? And as Christians, what, what do we think about that? You know, the Bible identifies three separate institutions as vital for ensuring social order and human flourishing. There's that word again. Uh, those three institutions are the family, human government or the state, and the church. Uh, some Christians actually add a fourth. If you've studied that the theologically, some add like the... Uh, the uh, work relationship, and, and that's not my point to dissect that today and figure out if there's three or there's four, but at, at a minimum, Christians tend to agree that there's at least three institutions. And, and the reason we identify those three, if you will, is because each of these institutions not only comes with an authority structure, but each of them also then carries a set of responsibilities. 
And as you do your own study and you work through your classes here, you'll, you'll notice that God gave these three institutions and they work together to ensure order. They, they, they work together to ensure flourishing, if you will. Um, and, and there's overlap. There's overlap in them for sure. I mean, you can see that the, the family, and these are my words, so if you want to take issue with them, and they're not, you know, Certainly, they're not canonical, these words, but, but it seems that the family's main priority is the prosperity of the race, the prosperity of human beings. I've also seen, of course, you could add uh, the propagation. You sometimes see that when God said to, to Adam and Eve and those after, you know, be fruitful, multiply, to continue bearing children, birthing image bearers of mine. So both of those would work. But the family's job is to ensure the prosperity of the race. Human government is to ensure protection, protection from injustice. The church is responsible for the proclamation of theology, the gospel. There's overlap, right? I mean, the, the family also may protect, not in the same way. Certainly, while the church proclaims theology, it doesn't absolve us as individuals. I mean, we're supposed to be faithful in our witness as well, right? So there's some overlap here. But there also are very clear lines of authority. Uh, by the way, an important point, if you are taking notes and you want to jot something down here, remember when God endowed these three institutions, this says nothing, that the authority structure says nothing about the value of the people. The parent is not worth more than the child. A pastor, a bishop, an overseer is not worth more than a congregate. The king, the president, the prime minister is not worth more. That's, that's something that's lost in our culture today, in our anti-authority <laughs> culture that we often live in. God didn't endow these institutions with a structural authority because he said, well, you know, that, that one's a little more important. That one's worth more in my eyes. He was giving us something that helped us create a good, orderly society. And therefore, as I've written there on, the, on the, uh, your sheet there, whenever one of these breaks down, it leads to a dysfunction in our culture. Whenever the family breaks down, it just doesn't work. As hard as we try, it, it's not going to work as God intended. When the church isn't doing its job, or when the church even oversteps its authority, it just doesn't work how it was supposed to. God, in his infinite genius, created this all to work a certain way. Now, I know it's going to be hard because of the larger room and things, but I've been talking a lot. Let me just ask a simple question. When it does break down, in terms of one of the three institutions tending to overstep its authority, which of the three do you think it tends to be? If you, if you lengthen the shadow backwards into history, which of these three institutions tends to try to overwhelm the other two with its authority? What do you think? Okay, good. I mean, that, that, that one, history has one page on this one. Now, there, there are examples, certainly, of the church or certain religious traditions probably taking to themselves authority they were not intended to have. We could find probably in some feudal setting in Europe or elsewhere or or warlords in some part of the world where, where the family perhaps is doing more than it was attended to. But typically it's the state with its immense resources and broad powers that is most likely to, to usurp its mandate, which means to take on more authority than it was intended to. So this is also an important consideration. And remember, all we're doing here is planting seeds. What do we establish so far? God said, hey, you can be loyal to both God and state. In fact, it was God's idea embedded in the Bible where he gives us all these authoritative institutions to help maintain social order. Again, it's the state that unfortunately tends to usurp its authority, but that doesn't absolve our responsibility as Christians to living within the authority of the state, the family, the church, etc. All right, make sense so far? Let's plant another seed. And remember what we're doing. All we're doing is we're planting these seeds that we're going to hopefully develop these next couple of days so that we can answer that question. Remember the question? How do we move forward? 
How do we, how do we get past this? You know, David, I sit in Washington all the time, and we, we sit with people who, who desperately want to move forward, but at times they have that look on their face like, what do we do? How do we get out of this mess? And, and that's what we're trying to answer here today. Really important point then to make next. And that relates to this concept of human dignity. <clears throat> we are told something about human dignity in the Bible and this idea of natural law. And that is very simply this. Human dignity is rooted in the fact that every person equally bears the image of his or her creator. Um, I've actually preached a number of sermons just on this point, not in a religious freedom context even. It's such an important point, this whole idea of human dignity and, and understanding what it means and where it comes from. <clears throat> I mean, the highest rationale for religious freedom is the dignity of the human person, the human beings. Can I just take a quick side note? Because I don't know what you've brought in here today, and I certainly don't know everyone's background, but... You know, if you, if you understand this idea of human dignity, that it flows from the fact that you, pretend like you're alone in the room right now, you bear the image of your creator. And once you embrace that concept, I mean, it transforms a number of things. It transforms the understanding of self. It, you know, we all carry these bitternesses, these angers. You know, but people hurt us. We all have insecurities. We all kind of wonder, am I worthy? I mean, do you know what I've done? Do you know what I'm hiding right now? And the fact is, if we understand that you will never have more human dignity because you will never bear the image more, regardless of how you clean up your life or do this or don't do that, I mean, you have 100% of it right now. Our culture is talking a lot, you know, about self-esteem and self-actualization and self-realization. And, and there's an appropriate place for some of those conversations. You know, sometimes they tend to go off the rails a little bit. But the reality is we can all live with a great deal of self-esteem no matter where you've been or where you're going, no matter what you've done or what you're going to do in the future. We can all live with a semblance of self-esteem knowing that we bear the image of our Creator. You're worth something. It doesn't matter her. How, how beautiful you are or aren't. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. It doesn't matter, like I said, like I said what you've done or what you, you're worth something. And, and understanding this idea of human dignity transforms the understanding of self. It also transforms our human relationships. Even people who draw different truth conclusions than we do. I mean, even people who are very unlikable. Even people who have heard us, boy, that's a hard one. Separate conversation. I hate to even open the can of worms in saying that. But the fact is every single person bears the image of the creator and possesses an equal amount of human dignity. That idea right there is in many ways at the core of religious freedom. When we finish here in just a few minutes and, and we ask the question, so what is it we were made to do? What, what, what is God calling all human beings to do? Part of our human dignity is going to be this answer bound up in the concept of religious freedom. And so human dignity is another important seed to plant that we're going to try to tease out in classes and, and tonight over pizza and tomorrow again in chapel and things of that nature. But for now, we've got to keep moving. So we need to understand one more thing before we get to these final biblical principles where we'll end our time. And that is the fact that uh, we're talking about these contentious debates and what's going on in our culture. We've talked about human dignity. Again, humor me. I just want to make sure you're still awake and listening. Where does human dignity come from? Okay, there's a bunch of answers there, but all saying the same way. It's from the Creator, it's from God Himself. It's that inalienable right, if you will, that, that, that flows from him. But we need to understand the difference between natural rights and legal rights, or human rights and civil rights. 
This is just a practical consideration that's very important as you talk to your friends, your neighbors, or wrestle through these issues yourself. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, hasn't there, recently about civil rights and legal rights. But you know, a legal right or a civil right, a very legitimate concept, is essentially something that a government gives. They may give it to a group. They may give it to everyone. Uh, it's a legal right. <clears throat> I mentioned my son who needs the room check video. Uh, he just uh, in recent months got his driver's license. He's about to turn 17. Of course, he got it in 16. So, you know, what 16-year-old in America doesn't at least sort of dream a little bit about getting his driver's license or getting her driver's license? Well, that's sort of a, that's a cherished legal right in most states. It's a civil right, if you will. The, the collective will of the people, we the people in this country, the government has said, okay, take some sort of approved course and we will validate that you have a legal right to operate a vehicle at a certain age. That's a legal right. But that's not a natural right. That's not a human right. When we talk about human rights issues and human rights violations, no one's going to you know, say, well, if you can't drive to your 17, you're, you're in a violation of a fundamental human right. Because again, where do you think human rights come from? Where, where would they come from? It has to come from God. Don't have time to tease this one out either. But uh, a materialist, that's someone that doesn't believe that there's, there's a greater than human source out there. A materialist who thinks everything is explainable by material cause and effect. I'm not really sure where they get ethics. I'm not really sure where they get human rights. That's a separate conversation, but a human right is something that transcends what passport you carry, transcends your last name, transcends your ethnicity. You have it because you're human. And, and what we're trying to do out there in the culture, as I mentioned, at the Religious Freedom Institute, is we're trying to make this case that every single person has this human right called religious freedom. Why? Because they all have the same human dignity that all flows from the same stamp, the image stamp that they all bear by the fact that they're human. Because it answers the questions, what were we made to do? Here's where we finish our time. So what does the Bible say about all this? <clears throat> what, what are some of the, the principles that we can kind of hang our ideological hats on? It's like, okay, I'm, you're saying all these things. I'm getting some of it. That's why we got a handout. <laughs> if you want to refer back to any of it later, you can. But, but can you give me just some core principles? Again, I'm, I'm assuming most of you being here at, at, at GCU, you're, you, you, you identify as a Christian. You said, all right, that's me. I've embraced it. I, this is what I believe. All right, well, let me give you just a few principles then you can, you can hang your hat on, if you will, that can help you have these conversations and help you wrestle through these things in your own mind. <clears throat> I forgot I put this in there. I'm sorry. Nothing like a big setup and then letting all the air out. Let me quickly do that because it is an important point. Because I don't want to be misunderstood here. <clears throat> Uh, but as was mentioned, well, I've had the privilege of spending a lot of time overseas. I've trained, done a lot of pastoral training in restricted access, creative access nations, people whose lives are, are imperiled on a regular basis, who live with persecution. <clears throat> um, you know the stories. You know what's interesting is in some of those places in the Far East and Central Asia and Middle East and elsewhere, those are the places where the gospel is going forth with, with the greatest power. I, I sometimes it's amazing going some of these places of intense persecution, something David's going to talk about tomorrow, and, and, and the gospel is alive. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharp. It's penetrating the culture. People are coming to faith. And then you go to other places where, you know, religious freedom is sort of embraced, and our churches at times seem to be lethargic. At times I sort of have a hard time getting myself motivated to, to do these things. And what I don't want to be misunderstood is, is that we have to have religious freedom in order for the gospel to go forward. That's my point with this, the, the resiliency of the gospel, if you will. Because the fact is that the resilience of the gospel throughout history, in all political systems, Think back, and you've read some of those biographies, maybe back in communist 
you know, the, the, the Soviet Union, <clears throat> some of the persecution, some of the things these pastors went through. I have at home a little heel Bible. It's, it's this big. It's written on waterproof paper. It's the Gospel of Mark written in Russian. It's where pastors used to smuggle into the jail cells in, in the heel of their shoes, which is why it's called the heel Bible. Just for the privilege of being able to read that in, in the confines of their dark, cold cell. That the gospel was unleashed and powerful in that setting. I think of uh, you know, other, other places and other times. We talk about the Roman persecution. The fact is the gospel doesn't need a particular political circumstance or system to thrive. So I don't want to be misunderstood. David and I are not here these next two days promoting religious freedom because we think if we don't have religious freedom in this country, we're doomed. Right? The, I mean, the only way we're doomed is if God's not on the throne still. But if he is, then okay, that's not necessarily what we're talking about. So then what's the point? <clears throat> Again, I'm going to just make this and then jump over because we've got to finish. We've only got just a few minutes left here. A reminder that it's usually these authoritarian governments that do this. Why? Because if, if we have religious freedom, it means you're free to pursue an authority higher than the government. That's ultimately why any authoritarian government or a powerful private group wants to suppress religious freedom is because they want to be the highest authority. But when there's religious freedom, everyone's free to seek an authority higher than the state or the government. I needed that seat as well. But now here's where we finish our time. Four principles. These are those ideological pegs that I was talking about. Well, what are things that can lead me to believe, you know, as a Christian, a follower of Christ, that, that religious freedom's for me? It's for everyone. <clears throat> well... There's really three dimensions of religious freedom. You say, what is religious freedom? Three things that have to be true in a culture. Number one, everyone has to be free to explore. Explore wherever their mind takes them, wherever the Holy Spirit impresses upon their heart, I guess, to explore these truth claims. And then they have to be free to embrace them. <clears throat> now, I could stop right there just to say, even elements of our culture today that would not support the idea of religious freedom, they're pretty much okay with those two. Hey, you know what? Believe whatever you want. Sounds like you found something that's really meaningful to you. Great. For you, not for me, but no problem. You can explore and embrace whatever you want. But the third element that's all important for religious freedom is the idea of expression that you need to be able to express your faith, not just in the confines of your own mind, but in the classroom, in the courtroom, in the public marketplace. I mean, God does not call us to a faith. Remember that, that old song, that, that hide it under a bushel idea? A bushel basket, or, 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 or as the Bible itself talks about a flame that just is kept covered. I mean, our faith as believers was meant to be expressed. And we don't check it at the church door, check it at our home, and then just, you know, well, well, we'll go out there and we'll not be Christians, but we'll be it in here. And again, this could be, you know, we're not just talking about Christianity here as well. Religious freedom says everyone has the ability to explore, embrace, and then publicly express. Can I support that as a Christian? <clears throat> eight minutes. I got eight minutes left to do these four. We'll get done, I promise. Four principles, biblical principles of religious freedom for you to think about, pray about, contemplate over these next couple of days and perhaps beyond. <clears throat> the first biblical principle I would offer to you is that choice. Choice is a foundational principle on which all creation rests. Did you ever wonder why God created anything? Boy, that's, that's an apologetic topic that could take us Long time. God was inherently perfect, needing nothing to enlarge his glory. He didn't get any better with creation, and yet he did. He chose to do so. It's a fascinating topic. But the point is choice. God himself chooses. God gave to the, the angels, apparently, choice from what we read. Some chose to follow, some chose not to. God gave to the first human beings, his image bearers, the privilege of choice. Adam and Eve enjoyed perfect fellowship in the garden and ultimately made a bad choice. Uh, Moses in Deuteronomy 30 
told the Israelites, choose life. Joshua, in Joshua 24, 15, said, choose this day whom you will serve. Elijah, remember that story in the prophets of Baal? Told all those who were waiting or watching, if the Lord is good, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. You get into the New Testament. Uh, Paul said in Romans 14, verse 5, if you want to look that up later, that everyone should be fully convinced in their own mind. And this idea of choice keeps coming up over and over and over in the scriptures. The most remarkable, to me, scene of choice in all the Bible <clears throat> is the description of Jesus in Revelation 3, verse 20. The author and creator of everything stands at the door and patiently knocks. Doesn't kick the door in, doesn't stand there demanding what is rightfully his, but he just patiently invites <clears throat> those inside to respond to his gracious invitation. The idea of choice is fundamental <clears throat> to human. Now again, let me insert, I, I, I need to, I'm, I'm going to start talking fast. I apologize for that. It is my northern roots. I live in South Carolina now. I was born and raised in Michigan. It took them years to understand me because I talk very fast like a northerner when I'm uh, not careful. But I'm going to start talking fast to try to get through this. I, I insert this, please don't get distracted in the whole theological idea of choice, sovereignty, free will, all that. That's not what I'm necessarily talking about here. I know that's an appropriate discussion. If you're, if you're a Bible theology major, have that discussion, uh, but don't get distracted with it here. We're talking about the fundamental idea of choice. And the reason choice is so important is because God desires uncoerced worship. <clears throat> it's possible to coerce. You know what coerce is, right? to force something on someone. I mean, history is full of stories where, where countless individuals have been forced to bow to gods or sacrifice to idols not of their choosing. I can externally make you worship. But by contrast, the Christian understanding of worship begins with God's gracious, gracious invitation to enjoy fellowship with him, and that's a fellowship that does not rest on external conformity. I think it when Samuel reminded his readers and listeners that obedience is better than sacrifice. God doesn't just want our rituals. God just doesn't want us just going through the motions. In fact, my mind wanders to 1 Corinthians 13 when we talk about the ultimate test of motivation. You can become a martyr. You can give away everything you own, and if you're not doing it for the right reasons and the right motivation, God says it's worth nothing. So God desires uncoerced uncoerced, excuse me, worship. And so within a Christian worldview, a coerced worship is not authentic worship because it's not freely given. I mean, an individual would search in vain for a mandate in the New Testament that part of our gospel witness on the Great Commission is to go and coerce people into the kingdom. We're told, we're told to make disciples and to graciously invite and to model God's grace in our life. But, but I haven't found, and if you found it, please come up because I need to add it to my presentation. I can't find anywhere in the New Testament where we're told to go out and to coerce and, and make people externally conform to the truths of the gospel. And perhaps part of this is a third principle, is that seeking for others what we seek for ourselves is one of the purest expressions of Christian charity. The old golden rule, right? As it's widely known, it really lies at the heart of Jesus' admonition to love your neighbor as yourself. The parable of the Good Samaritan provides a strong model of coexisting and even seeking the good of others who differ from you, showing them love, if you will. The most basic justification for doing good to others in the same way we steward ourselves, remember, is that all individuals bear the same image. This could stop and we could preach a whole sermon at some point in the future on just this point. You know, it, it, it should be, a, how do you treat people on your Instagram accounts or your social media accounts? It's that gossiping ministry that many seem to have where we talk about people. It's, it's how we treat people. It's how we settle disagreements. I mean, all this comes down to this, this concept of love and this concept of, of creating my fellow image bearer in the way that I would want to be treated myself. And certainly as you think through that and apply that in the context of religious freedom, if we would not desire persecution, 
If I would not desire my wife and my daughters to be, to be uh, coerced to worship a certain way at the threat of rape, plunder, or mayhem, or if I don't want to pay a heavy fine for the privilege of being able to go to church on Sunday, I don't want those things. I mean, I, I think if you look those things up in the dictionary, it's under the letter M, called masochism. You know, which is a word for someone that enjoys pain. I don't think, we're not called to pain. We're not called to martyrdom. I mean, God might choose that for some of us. But seeking for others what we seek for ourselves is one of the purest expressions of Christian charity. And then number four, righteousness and justice are inseparable in the Bible. And the responsibility of all Christ followers. I don't think I have to make the case. If you are truly here as a Christian, you've embraced the gospel, you're trying to live out the Bible, I don't think I have to make the case that you're supposed to be righteous. That's sort of the point of the Christian faith is Christ-likeness. But don't forget that God's word, and I don't have time to read this now, it, it always links justice and righteousness. A, a righteous man cannot be an unjust man. A righteous woman cannot be an unjust woman. It doesn't compute. It doesn't work together. And I'll let you go with this if you promise to write down one phrase. And if you're not, not taking notes, just to take a mental note, if you will. What is all this for? You can read the summary later there, but remember this. Religious freedom, therefore embracing these things, religious freedom as we want to present it these two days, is not the right to be left alone. I'm afraid that gets lost far too often. Religious freedom is just the government stays out of my business and lets me just live my life the way I want. Religious freedom is not the right to be left alone, but it's the privilege of using one's faith to be a blessing to others. Religious freedom is not the right to be left alone, but from a Christian perspective, the privilege of using one's faith to be a blessing to others. God has been good to us in this country. We have historically enjoyed religious freedom like really no other people group in the history of the world. But that's also a gracious reminder of his. I, I didn't give you this. I've not allowed you to live in such a time as this so you can just go and be an island unto yourself. He wants us busy. He wants us active. He wants us taking advantage of this. He wants us out there building and doing the work of the Great Commission. So we've got some additional questions and answers hopefully here in classes. We'll be with many of you here later today and then in Titan tonight and then tomorrow. This, think of this as sort of a part one. We'll start drawing some of these things together as well. But for now, I am over time and the, the uh, thing is about to lower or the crook's going to come out shortly. So I'm just going to, can, can I quickly close this in prayer? We'll be done. God, thank you for this time. Uh, you, you are gracious to allow us to freely meet here. We ask for your blessing and everything that was said and protect us from those things that might distract us from your best. Go with us now. We ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.